Morning. Morning. So, um, welcome to Creative Mornings Derby. I know, um, looking out at the crowd, a whole bunch of you haven't been before, so I'll uh, give you a quick introduction. Creative Mornings is a, a global lecture series for the creative community, and there's, I think, 260 chapters, which means we're in 260 different cities across the world. And this month's theme is Justice. It's done by Simone Chichova, I think in Georgia somewhere. Um, but every Creative Mornings across the globe talks about the same topic. So there's 260 videos, 260 talks every month all on the same topic, giving us a really good kind of global view of how this is interpreted. We can't do Creative Mornings without our lovely local partners. In the main, it would be Mainframe, um, who is represented by Shaw. Where is she? Where is Charmaine? Charmaine. <laughs> um, there she is, from Mainframe. Um, and Hannah, who's on holiday currently. So if we can all wave and say, hello, Hannah, when I put my camera up, that would be amazing. We'll send her a little thing. Everyone say, hello, Hannah. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, also, Future Proof Films, who you will see with all the video equipment. Future Proof Films, stand up, give us a wave. Jess, Drew, Rob. Um, they do amazing videos. I think technically we have the best creative morning videos out of all 260 chapters. We've got a central print service, Yvonne. Where are you? Where was that? There. Ah, there she is. Uh, who does our lovely flyers, who's done our roller banner and has been here with us from the beginning. So thank you, Yvonne. Um, we've also got today an opportunity for people to do a thing called 30 second pitches. Right? So 30 second pitches are where you guys get to come up to the stage. We've got a couple booked in already. I know Paul Ince, just here from Marketed Live. And Jenny, where's Jenny gone? There she is. We'll be coming in. So, Marketed Live is our very special sponsor today. Paul, stand up. Marketed Live is one of the best marketing events in the country, if not the world, right? The best. Huh? Not one of the best. The best. The best, technically. And he'll be telling us a bit more about it later. But um, we started it in this city, didn't we? Actually, at the Roundhouse in, what was it, 2017? Yeah. 2017, so it's on its third, fourth year. I'm not very good at maths, what is it? Third year. Um, and it's growing from strength to strength. And Paul is the hostess with the, with the mostess. So I'm a bit nervous hosting a thing in front of the man who is the king of that sort of thing. Um, so, without further ado, we'll get on with the main event, I think. And we've got a really special speaker today, Rob Dawes from Future Proof Films, local legend. Stand up, Rob, give him a round of applause. <laughs> Yeah. He's going to uh, be talking on the theme of justice. I shall leave you to the man himself. Hi, uh, thanks for coming out. I know as creative people, early morning starts aren't really our thing. But I also know we'll crawl on our bellies over broken glass for a free breakfast. So that's great. And I just noticed this lovely banner. Embarrassingly, I'm wearing almost the same outfit. So uh, <laughs> had I seen that before, I perhaps would have changed. But um, Future Proof Films, there's normally a few of us here. Um, for the free breakfast, but uh, Joe and team, they're out filming on a project, so it's, it's, it's just the three of us today. And we've been sponsors since the start. We've only been going, this is the fourth one. Another way of looking at that is we waited four whole months until nepotism crept in and then we did the talk as well. <laughs> um, but part of it is I, I've, I've sat through, I've probably watched the three that we've recorded, I don't know, 20 times maybe. And there's a bit of a structure that emerges. And I want to play within the structure. I don't want to break it. And that's kind of fitting with the theme that I want to chat about today. Now, in the structure, everyone uses a meme, OK? And I, I was struggling for a meme. And I didn't want to meme just for meme's sake, if you know what I mean. And Tim handed me one in the 11th hour. Um, because 
I found out quite late in the day that I wasn't the first person from Future Proof Films that Tim asked to do the talk. Okay, so it almost derailed the whole thing. I was going to do, the, you know, the injustice of being asked second and not being first choice. But I'm thankful because Tim gave me the use of a meme. And there's me, Tim, checking out everyone else from Future Proof Films. <laughs> But ultimately, it was going to be too much work. It was going to be too much work to redo, redo the whole thing, because I had already planned a bit of work. I did one more slide, just Tim stabbing me in the back. <laughs> uh, but on to justice. The, the structure that's kind of emerged, the first part is to talk about, with relation to the theme, how you, your thought process on, on the topic you want to talk about. And when Tim first spoke to me, not spoke to me first, We've established that. But when he first spoke to me, I thought, justice, brilliant. I, I studied law. I've got a good law degree, and I make videos. You know, I should be in the justice system. Maybe I could do kind of a career change thing with the creative pull, pulling you away from your career. But I didn't really start a career in law. I kind of found out early on. So, But I did want something that could kind of be universal to all creative people. And... To check we're on the right page, hands up if you either, the creative part that you do for your job, if you either studied it or it was a hobby that became, became the thing that you do. Show of hands. So quite a lot. And keep them up. Keep them up if, since being you know, paid to do it and earning a living doing that creative thing, you think that the creative process has changed a bit for you. It's not as free-spirited. You're kind of, you know, there's, other things there, creative constraints, yeah, that's fine. Hands down, that's the only bit of audience participation. Um, and, and that's what I want to talk about. It's the crimes against creativity, you know. It's quite a bold statement. I don't actually mean it to be that bold, but I had to link it to justice, so it's crimes against creativity. And the kind of external factors that you, that you face when you start, start earning a living, start a business, work within a business, and for your creative endeavours, really. And so the first example that sprung to mind, and it's nice that we're in the movie mecca of Derby, the first example that sprung to mind was a film where the producers, directors, writers, they'd spent years honing their craft, working away and developing the skills so they can land one of the most revered fra film franchises you know, in cinema history. And you're all here, you're creative, you're cinephiles, you'll know what I'm on about. It's part of the and the series. It's the Fast and the Furious, OK? <laughs> You know, cinema got not yet won an Oscar, not yet, but th they keep making them, so who knows, eventually. But within the movie industry, it's not unheard of for producers to impose their creative will onto a film because ultimately they've got funding for this film and it's probably based on some of their ideas. But it's still a creative idea, so it's still okay. But with Fast and the Furious, something interesting emerged where it's not definitely not a creative reason. It's ego-driven. And that's the stars having their contracts that they can't lose a fight. Okay, So they can start fights and they can win fights against nobodies, but against each other, they're basically left with... The writers and directors are left with one thing to do. Come up with interesting ways where it ends up to be a draw, basically. <laughs> Every fight between the main stars, it's a draw. You know, it gets interrupted, the rooftop gets blown off, and there's a draw. And it sounds so trivial, but for an action film, you need your hero to get knocked down, go through four or five training montages, and then overcome and beat the big bad. And it's just an absurd imposition onto, you know, your creative values. It's, it's something which you'll come up to with time and time again with clients. Well, not time and time, every now and again. And I'm sure you don't have to think very hard to think of an instance where someone's given you some kind of, you can't do this. I know it's, uh, we, we had it recently where a company wanted, it's quite a stale industry, and they wanted a, a young, fresh image with young people, and they're having a good time. It's not the stale industry people expect. But you can't show anyone smiling or laughing because it's still a professional industry. It's like, OK, OK, yeah, we'll work with that. And, and it's those kind of things. And, and what I want to talk about is how can you protect your creative values when you, when you undertake jobs like that? Now, I mistakenly thought this was part of the Anther series, but I'd been 
remembering it wrong all the time. But we've done a, a film great, a cin cinema great, and let's look at a literary one. And it's The Catcher in the Rye. And for me, this was a book where everyone has a film, a song, a book that seems to have changed their outlook on life. And, and they can remember exactly the dates they were when they saw or read it. And for me, this was the 22nd of July, 2019, about four weeks ago. So it's easier to remember. <laughs> But, but it still counts. And I, I did a deep dive onto J.D. Salinger. He's an interesting guy. But I thought, why is there no film of this? Like, you read it, and it's such a filmic conjuring, like an image of New York that he creates. And it's so good. And it's because he's a, he's a proud writer, and he wanted it to stay in the medium, and he wanted to own that. And he refused to, for it to be a film and to sell the movie rights. And then when he died a few years ago, in his estate, he left instructions to for it to never be, never be a film, so it'll never be a film. So he, he full on refused to bend his creative will. Um, I will point out he did have a bit of an odd relationship with cinema. When he was, he was involved in the D-Day landings, he was at war, and his girlfriend at the time, on her 18th birthday, married Charlie Chaplin at 54. So he, he didn't like cinema, he didn't like actors in particular. In, in The Catcher in the Rye, he calls them the biggest phonies of all. But he definitely was protecting that he wanted it to remain as a literary piece and a, and a piece of literature. And I say it's not recommended because when you start working with clients and they come with you with their, you know, their demands and requests and things, I just don't see it as a working model or a great start to a relationship if you refuse to bend your will and if there's no compromise or collaboration, which is how you look at it. So, so there's other ways that you need to view it. Part of the Anna series again. We'll just Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, there's two ways of telling the tale. Gene Wilder. Some say he wrote this part. Some say he saw it in the script, and it, it was so important to him that in his contract, the entrance for his character, he had it contracted that they could not change that. He, he knew the movie industry. He knew changes would, would be made throughout, but he had it contracted that he couldn't that they could not touch this one part that, that set up the character. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's so great. It's a great performance, but he, it sets Willy Wonka up as the, the unreliable narrator. He's, you know, he's presenting himself as this old man, and then he's nice and agile. And it's kind of the theme running through it. He's this nice guy who builds these you know, these wonderful things for children, but then he's also just doing horrific things to children and letting them get caught in, within the, uh, you know, the factory and things like that. But he protected that creative reason. He fought for that creative reason that he took the job or wanted to play that part. And I think within every project, no matter how dry it might be, there is that creative thing. You know, you might not be able to break the mold with it, but you'll be able to do something different that's not been done and not been seen by the client or within the industry. And you've got to fight for that creative, that creative reason that you took the project. Part of the Anna series again. So one more example, really. It's Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel. I made the title up so it fit the Anna series. Um, <laughs> made the poster up. You know, these are Roman numerals. That's how deep I went. And uh, 15, 12. And um, so the, the story goes that he refused several times to paint the Sistine Chapel. Um, either he looked down on painting or felt he had mastered painting and referred to himself as a sculptor, or he was just a sculptor. And he, he preferred that as, as his art form, really. And he refused, and Pope Julius II asked him twice. The second time, with a bit of an army, asked him, and he accepted. So it was kind of against his will. But what he did was he saw the creative challenge within that. So he thought of himself as a sculptor, and it was a big fresco painting he was going to do. And his plan was to start, start at one end and then work his way towards you know, the, the, the famous pieces on the fresco. And by that time, over many years, he'll be good. And the, and the paintings, they do start well, but they definitely do get better. Um, but he. he found that creative challenge, he embraced it. He might not have had a choice, but the creativity, the, the creative person inside him came out. 
and he had fun with it. So he needed to paint the sun and the moon. So he did the sun and the moon. Uh, some people say that's, that's mooning the church or mooning uh, the Pope at the time. And that's his self-portrait, one of only a few. And so it looks like it probably took its toll on his creative soul. Um, and that's how he viewed himself, but towards the, towards the end of the process. But it was a success. And, you know, it's a, it's a famous piece. So out of, out of being pinned into that and having to do that, that thing that he didn't want to do, something great came out because he embraced that creative challenge. And that's another kind of mindset that you can get around when you are on a project which might be sapping your soul or the creativity from it. Um, back to the structures, structure of the creative morning, so there's life lessons now. Um, but they're, they're all kind of from the example. So you've got to accept some con cre uh, creative constraints. You're not free-spirited anymore. You're not, like myself, I would think about a movie idea and I'd be like, oh, you know what? In three months, I'll start writing that idea. And then you start doing business and all of a sudden you're like, okay, by 5 p.m., I need that finished script. And there are deadlines and things do change. But on the other hand, you're doing something you love and you're getting paid for something you love. And it, and in there, there's so much reward within that that it's worth that compromise, I think. And if you can find that, that, that creative reason for the work, sometimes you might have to look extra hard. But if you find it, then you're still doing creative work, nourishes the soul, things that you love and that you can be proud of. And more pragmatic is break your creative drought. So it's only happened a couple of times where I got myself, we've been going four and a half years, you get in a little bit of a funk. And I think retrospectively, you see that it's just because you've just done too many dry projects. You've just done too many things where you can't find that creative reason for doing them. It's important for the business, and that's great. But the way around it, if you have a team, moan to your team, swap projects. If you don't, do something fun. Do something fun on the side. The reason you started you know, doing whatever you do creatively, and just do it for you, and do it for the, to break that creative drought. And back onto the justice slide. Finally, it's really just, just to remind you that crimes against the creativity, it's a tenuous link, but it is still definitely linked. Thank you. Thank you.